want to talk about handling your business. Okay? Everybody say, turn to your neighbor and say, handle your business. The title is misleading. It's not, if you saw the picture on Facebook, it looks like the two people are about to fight. Actually, they're not. But um, we're going to dive right into this and, and just talk about a word that's not spoken a lot in church. But I sometimes I think there's a good side of it and there's a bad side of it. And we're going to talk about offense. Everybody say offense. And if you've been on this earth long enough, you've been offended before, right? Has anybody in this room has not been offended in your whole life? Let me see your hand. Nobody hand went up. It didn't even a thought to go up, right? Some of you may have got offended before you got here today, right? Some of you may have got offended in your marriage. You may have got offended in, with your coworker. Um, you may have got offended with, if you got kids, you get offended all the time, right? I mean, you say, throw the trash out, but it's actually throw, it, it, to me, to them, it means just place the trash beside the trash can, right? Um, but a lot of times, kids offend us, and a lot of times, our spouse offends us. Um, a lot of times, our coworkers, well, most of the time, your coworkers do offend you. And so I want to talk about offense today and how to deal with offense because I think that in knowing how to deal with offense, we're going to grow. And I'm going to tell you something. There's, some help, there's a healthy side to offense, but there's also a dangerous side to offense. Can, can you agree with me? You say, I never heard anybody say there's a healthy side of offense. Yeah, there is a healthy side of it. Amen? So let's jump right into the scripture. Let's go to Luke chapter 17, and I'm going to start with verse 1. And, and I'll take my time with it because um, I really want to grab a hold of this. Is anybody uh, interested in growing today? Let me see your hand. Anybody interested in developing today? And so before I was able to teach this, I had a developmental, pro a developmental process that I've been going through, which when offense came, to came towards me, um, I would actually be quiet about it and don't say anything. I'm the type of person where I don't really start strife or division. Um, I just... If someone comes to me and offends me, I kind of just take it in and just leave it and walk away because that's what I always grew up doing. What, what, the main reason why is I wasn't big enough to fight back, so that was the main reason I just shut my mouth, right? A lot of you guys are bigger than me in here, so when offense comes to you, you're like, well, let's just get it on right now, okay? But in my situation, when offense came, it was like, all right, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to just wait to the perfect opportunity. Anybody know what that perfect opportunity is? the perfect opportunity to get back at someone, right? In those moments, if you grab a hold of offense for what it really is, those opportunities come up every single day. And what we call that is revenge. Everybody say revenge. There's always going to be an opportunity to get revenge on somebody. But my question to you is this. Are you jumping on that opportunity or are you holding back for something else? Are you with me right now? I'm not going over your head, are you? I'm trying to just lay a little foundation for you guys. And so in Luke chapter 17, verse 1, it says this. Then he said to the disciples, listen, pass this off for me. Then he said to the disciples, it is, let's read that together. It is impossible that no offense should come. That word offense means this. In the, Greek, it mean, in the Greek, it's translated scandal. And from that word, it's translated trap stick, like the, like the, um, the stick on a mouse trap. And so in, in saying that, it also can be a stumbling block. It also can be a temptation. And like I said, if you lived on this earth long enough, you've ran into stumbling blocks. You've ran into temptations before. You've ran into um, just things that have gotten in our way to stop us from getting where God wants us to get. And in 1 first, first, first Peter chapter 5, verse 8, let's go there real quick because I want to break this down a little bit. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, it says, stay alert. Everybody say, stay alert. Turn to your neighbor and say, stay alert. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. You're going to have a lot of enemies in your life. <laughs> right? But the source a lot of times behind that person who you call your enemy is the devil. 
Okay? So it says to stay alert with a, a, a symbol behind it. That means, listen, we have to be on guard all the time. Stay alert. Watch out your great enemy, the devil. Now listen to this. I want you to look at this. We'll break this down. He prowls around like. Everybody say like. Key word in this scripture is like. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to, everybody say devour. See, the enemy is going around pretending to be something he's not to destroy people like us who don't know who we are. That's pretty much what it's saying. The enemy is going around every single day, and he's posing as this incredible force, but he's ultimately pretending to be what he's not in order to devour people like us who don't know who we are. See, it's harder for him to devour you when you know who you are, but when you think less of yourself, his actions of pretending will take over, everybody say, your life. So in knowing that now, it says stay alert, watch out, watch out. Let me say it this way. Watch out for the pretender. Did you get that? Watch out for the, watch out for the lookalike. Because if a lion came in this room, listen, this mic comes off and I'm running out the door. I don't know what you're going to do. I really don't care what you're going to do. He's not going to get me, right? If a real lion came through that door, preaching stops. I don't know what else happens after that. My body print is through the wall. I'm gone, okay? But he says that the enemy poses and he pretends to be this unstoppable force to devour people like us who don't know who we are. Now go back to Luke chapter 17, verse 1, because I want to show you something. Everybody got that paper, right? Might be familiar to some of you guys, might not be familiar to you, okay? Whatever. Um, <laughs> that is an offense report. Probably not the actual one the police department uses because I saw the one that they use and it has a lot of information up there, right? But on that paper, it's awkward. What is the awkward thing you see on that paper? Somebody tell me. What do you see on that paper? Jesus. Where does it say Jesus at? Underneath, what's underneath the word Jesus? Report it. Jesus is reporting this offense. This is what the scripture says. Then he said to his disciples, it is impossible that no one should, no, that no offense should come. He's saying that, look, offense is going to come your way whether you like it or not. It's coming. It's going to show up. It's going to stick his head out. And it's going to keep coming constantly over and over again. So it said it is, it is impossible that no offense, everybody say, should come. Okay? Now, reason being is this. It says it's reported by God, but there's another section up there I want you to look at. The, the section that's in the square. What does it say? It says approved by. No, what does it say? Reproved or what does it say? Um, Approved by? Let me check yours out real quick. Oh, they didn't give me one. It says um, approved by, okay? And date closed. I want you to look at the word date closed because there's a lot of you that have gotten offended and you don't have a closing date on your offense, right? But it's approved because Jesus said it in the scriptures, right? That's what it says in Luke 17, 1. But the closing date is still to be determined. So what that's saying is a lot of us don't have an actual date or remembrance when we actually close that offense. And we're walking around like everything's okay, but that offense is still lingering there day after day, month after month, and, it's getting, and that paper turns from one paper to two papers to three papers to four papers to five papers. If I gave you one of these to fill out every day, there wouldn't be enough room for you to fill out how many times people offended you in a day. Not... not Nonetheless, how many times you took that offense and ran with it? 
See, there's a stopping place where, see, where offense comes in where you have to say, you know what, I'm not going to be offended by what you said. But there is another aspect of it that says, I'm going to take your offense and I'm going to build on it. And this is where we get from the, this is where we get that model where I got to work hard for everything and it's me against the world. No, 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 no. It doesn't go like that. Offense, turn to your neighbor right now. Just say this to your neighbor. Just look at your neighbor. You might not even know him. I guarantee you, though, you'll offend him one day. <laughs> turn to your neighbor right now and say this. I am sorry for my future offenses on you. You may not know me. I may look at you wrong. I may look at you funny. I'm sorry. Don't you wish, now you ain't got to repeat that after me. <laughs> Don't you wish, you just, that would cover all, you know how you say um, the prayer of salvation, it just covers you like, hey, I'm saved, you know. If I do wrong, you know, God still loves me, but there are, um, um, there are things that may happen to me if I do do wrong, but, you know, but God still loves me. But I wish it was something like that where you say, I, I, Liz, I just apologize for you for all my future offenses. I just apologize ahead of time. And then it gives me the, the ability to go ahead and unleash everything I have to say about you. Right? It doesn't go like that, though. You can't just say it one time and say, hey, all right, now I got a wide open door to offend you now. No, it doesn't work like that. So everybody say offense. All right? Check this out. So there's two people Jesus is talking about here. Okay? Two people. He's talking about the offender and the person being the, the offender and the person that's being offended. Okay? And all of us have been on both sides of this track before, right? We've been on both sides. A lot of us, like myself, I've dished out offense before. But I've received my share of it too. Okay? Now, no one in this room will escape offense. Offense will come. Listen, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I don't think the screen is working anymore, so you guys just use the Bible, if you got your Bible. Oh, it cut off? Okay. Just try to power, if you could power back on, just try, oh, won't? Okay, cool. All right. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we can go old school. Pull out your Bibles. No, we're new school. It's supposed to be new school. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. All right. I'm going to read it out of the New King James Bible. It says, no temptation, which can be translated as offense, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. So any temptation that you've been through, any offense that you've been through, you're not the only one going through it. So we need to stop saying, I'm the only one going through this. No, no, no. The temptation and the offense that's come to you is common to everybody, right? Somebody said, you know, you're, hey, you ugly. I bet everybody probably heard that before, right? Okay. Some of you guys, like, I ain't never heard that before. They probably didn't say it out loud. They probably said it in their head. A lot of people say stuff in their head, okay? Like, I fuss with my wife in my, in, in my head because I can't win when I say it out here like this. So I just say it in my head, okay? <laughs> so no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. But it says, but God is faithful. Yeah. Right? Turn to the neighbor and say, God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted or not allow the offense beyond what you're able to bear. But with the offense and with the temptation, he will also make a way of escape. And that's what the Bible says. You know what's so cool about that is? Is that you can't escape, you cannot escape offense, but you can escape being offended. Oh, somebody, you didn't hear me. You can't escape offense coming because you can't control the person next to you. You can't control your coworker. You can't control your spouse. Offense is going to come. You can't escape offense. But what you can escape is getting offended. And offense is going to come. It's going to come when you walk out of this building. And what we want to learn today is how to handle these offenses. Turn to your neighbor and say, handle your business. Turn to your other neighbor and say, handle your business. Turn to your other neighbor and say, handle your business before your business handles you. Okay? Now, it gives that to us who've been offended. Now it gives a warning to the offender. Back in Luke 17, it says, but woe to him 
who they do come. Woe to the person who the offense comes through. There's two sides of this now. And then I always read this, and I I always skipped over it because I got really offensive about it. Because it says right here, um, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea, then he should offend one of these little ones. And I always was like, man, he's saying you might as well just kill yourself. But the Bible ain't saying that. Okay? No, he's... (laughs) I just skipped over that part because it's in red letters, so Jesus said it, right? I just skipped over that because I was like, wow, that is drastic. I would never offend anybody again. But it's not saying go kill yourself, so don't go kill yourself, okay? What he's saying is the weight of that offense is just as heavy as you being in water with this device around your neck dragging you down with no help to get up. That's how strong offense is, is that it's better off that you be by yourself than offend one of these. It's better that you have company with someone and offend them, it's better for you just to be by yourself. That's what the scripture is saying here, okay? Everybody say offense. So the real question is, is how do we handle these offenses? I believe that if if we learn how to handle offenses, this goes for every church in America right now. If we learn how to handle offenses, guess what? Churches will grow. Your marriages will grow. Your relationship with your kids will grow. Your relationship with your coworkers will grow. If we learn how to handle, everybody say offense. Point number one, I'm going to just give two points today because I don't want to rush through it. I said we're going to do a three, probably a three-part series on this, okay? Number one, if you got a pen, write this down. Write this down. This is very important because we're talking about handling your business. Number one, take back control of your business. Everybody say take back control of your business. Why is that important? When I say business, I'm not really talking about an establishment. I'm talking about your business, right? You know, I tell somebody, mind your business. It's your business, so mind it, right? So take back control of your business. The Bible says right there is is in the scriptures in Luke 17, verse number 3. It says, take heed to yourselves. Before it goes into asking for forgiveness, when people come to you asking for forgiveness, it says, number one, everybody say, take heed to yourself. What that means is... Pay attention. Guard yourself. Watch out. Watch out for yourself. Before you do anything else, we got to take care of, everybody say self. Take heed of self. You are in charge of your own information. You are in charge of your own information. You are personally responsible for the success and failure in your life. You are. And so I tell people this all the time, because a lot of people, how many of you just go on the Internet anyway? Just go on the Internet for just the surf, or you do Facebook or Instagram. Let me see your hands if you do Internet. If you don't do the Internet, you keep your hands down. But if you do do Internet, okay. So listen to this. Let me, let me explain this. I had to explain this to our young people. Don't get offended when I say this, okay? If you voluntarily post something, be prepared to voluntarily receive criticism. Right? Is that right or wrong to say? If you voluntarily, if you just get them and say, oh, this is how I feel, uh, post, gone, out in, out in the cloud, it's out there. If someone who doesn't like you or does like you decides to voluntarily get up and say, oh, you got a post, let me post back. I don't like it. If they, they have the right to voluntarily post something back, and you shouldn't get mad about it because you voluntarily put it out there. That's in life. If you voluntarily surrender information to someone and they use that information for someone else, you can't get mad at them. You voluntarily put it out there, right? If you didn't want them to know it, then what would you do? Not tell them, right? And so that's how offense starts. It's so weird to think about that offense starts with us. Oh, come on now. You know, because if you never knew anything about me, you wouldn't say anything about me, right? But because you know so much about me because I posted and I put it everywhere, you know so much about me, it's damaging to me now. And now I brought the offense on myself. So now that puts me in a situation where now I'm forced to only post what's positive. Oh, come on now. I'm only forced to say what's positive because if I say something negative, you're going to use it against me. And I'm going to get offended by it. But even though I brought the offense on myself. Oh, you guys ain't getting this. So I always thought offense, and a lot of times offense is rooted in because of someone's passing. Yeah, that's true. But a lot of times 
offense starts with us. That's why the Bible says to take heed. You know, somebody wrote as I read this quote that minding your business is a full-time job, so you should always be employed. <laughs> always. You should always have a job taking care of your business. Right? Is that right or wrong? Is that wrong to say? Let me apologize if I offended you right now. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Are we back on track? <laughs> But I love what Paul says. Paul is talking to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to start with verse 12. I just added this one in. 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. Let's start with verse number 12. Um, it says this. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thy example of the believer in these aspects, in word, in your conversation, in charity, in spirit of faith, and in purity. Till I come, the Bible says in verse 13, to give attention to reading to the exhortation of the doctrine. Verse 14 says, neglect not the gift that is in you which was given thee by prophecy, which the laying on of hands of the, of, which was laying on the hands. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Now verse 16 is where I want to get to. It says, take heed to yourself. What does that take heed mean? Watch out, stay alert, be ready, guard yourself. And guard the doctrine, which means what comes out of your mouth. Guard yourself and guard what comes out of your mouth. Why? Because for doing this, no, I skipped over part, hold on. Take heed of yourself and the doctrine. And it says to continue in them. In doing this, um, you will save both yourself and those who hear. So it says to stay alert, guard yourself. It says pay attention to the doctrine that comes out of your mouth. But it also says to continue in them. The problem is we're not staying on top of guarding ourselves. And another problem is we're not um, staying on top of the doctrine, which is the word. The Bible says that when you continue to do these things, when you continue to mind your business and take care of your company and to take care of yourself, and then also just get a little relationship with the Bible, the Bible says that in doing this, you will cause both you and yourself, I mean, yourself and others to be saved. Isn't that what church is about to get people saved, right? I mean, that's the whole, that's the reason why we're here. We're here to grow, we're here to develop, but we're also here to learn something to go out to save people. So it says I got to take care of me first and have a relationship with his word. Amen. Everybody say his word. So I like this little, this, well, I really don't like it. I I'm going to stop saying I like when I really don't like. But I, people say this and I just don't get it. Let me, you know, when someone comes up to you, right, um, and say, no offense, and then they say what they got to say. Now let me explain something. Do you say none taken before he says it, before he says what he's going to say, or do you say none taken after? I've never been in that situation before, but I'm just asking you guys. They just say it to me. They don't say no offense. Has anybody had that? Somebody say no offense, but blah, 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 blah. And then you say no taken, or do, you, or do they say no offense, and you say none taken, and then let them say what they're going to say? <laughs> Some of you guys say, I don't say anything. So what you're saying is none taken then pretty much. So what none taken means is this, and, 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 and no, I mean, no offense means this to me. I'm about to insult you, and you can't get mad. Is that what it means? I mean, in my book, I don't know what it means in your book, but in my book means I'm about to let loose on you. Don't get mad. Is that please don't get mad? Don't get mad. And so I believe I give a lot of credit to the people who say none taken. I want to be a none taken person, right? I know that sounds funny. I want to be a none taken person, right? I want to have the ability to say none taken before, right after you say no offense. I don't want to hear what you got to say. I, I mean, I want, I want to hear what you have to say, but I want to accept the fact that I'm not going to get offended before you say it, right? 
I think we need to become people who are none taken. Even if it's true, right? Even if it's not right. But someone says, no offense, and let's loose on you. What kind of person are we going to be? Check this out. Let's, let's, read, let's read what the Bible. I found, I found a scripture that I want to share with you guys. Proverbs 19.11. And I got it in the NLT version. I think this is pretty cool. It says, sensible people control their temper, right? They earn respect by overlooking wrong. Sensible people control their temper. They earn respect by overlooking wrong. Let me ask you a question. How many times have you had to overlook wrong? Someone did wrong to you and you had to say, you know what? True or not true, I'm not going to respond on it. A lot of us, it's so, a lot of us wait for the opportunity. You say no offense, let me have it, I'm going to let you have it. And I'm a no offense to you too, right? <laughs> i never seen a double no offense, right? Like, no offense, I don't like your hair with no offense. I don't care what you say, you know, whatever. i never seen a no offense, no offense before. But I think we should be people that say none taken and keep it moving, right? Yeah, this ain't going over too well, right? <laughs> <laughs> Listen to this. <laughs> Go to Galatians real quick. I'm, a, I'm, I'm pulling the scriptures out that they don't have. Galatians 6. Um, Offense is an event. Offended is a choice. Offense is an event. It's a time slot. It's reserved for you. It's coming no matter what you think about it. But being offended is a choice you make. You can choose to take the offense that's given to you or displayed in front of you and get offended. But what we want to learn is, is how not to get offended. And some of you guys say, well, I built my reputation on being offended. Well, that's going to change. I built my reputation on having a remark when you have a remark. I, I built my reputation on having a great comeback line. Like, I hate you. I hate you more, you know? <laughs> some of us have built really good reputations off our comeback lines. And some of us keep them in our back pocket waiting to use them. And I'm going to challenge you. We're going to challenge you through this series to not to get so offended. Amen? Galatians 6, 4. I, I love this scripture. It says this. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in the other man's work. You didn't catch that, did you? But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself. So no matter what you're doing, I'm rejoicing because I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. But when I take my eyes off you, I get offensive because of what you're doing. But I won't get offensive if I keep my eyes on myself, minding my own business. Right? So everybody say, it's time that we take our business back. Point number two. I love this point. What is your return policy? Every company is built on a strong return policy. Anybody in this room, the two companies I love the most are Walmart and Amazon. They'll take back anything, right? No receipt, give it here, I'll take it. I've called Amazon, I ordered something three years ago, they took it back. Walmart, I took something to them, they just dropped it here. Just, I give you a gift card, whether it's credit or cash. I buy things based on the, ref the, the return policy, and I buy, I buy things based on the warranty, right? Do you do that, or do you just go for price? I used to go for price until everything I went for price on always broke. And if you, got, if you don't have a strong return policy, then you just wasted your money. And then you're going to end up spending more money than we were supposed to spend at first because the warranty policy didn't pan out to be what you thought it was. So I buy things based on warranty. And I buy things based on the return policy. Anybody like that in here? You buy things based on return policy. Okay? Now, Walmart and Amazon have built these mega companies, um, and they've established certain rules in customer service. And so when I'm talking about what is your return policy, as a person, what is your rate of return? 
When offense comes, do we base it on who the person is? Do we base it on how they look? Do we base it on how big the offense was? Do we base it on whether we like them or not? Or if it took them five years or ten years to say sorry? How, what, what, what is your refund or your return policy when people offend you? Are they able to come right back up to you and say, I'm sorry? Or it's like, you know what, I'm just going to avoid you because I don't want to have to deal with this. No, if your return policy is that, then it's wrong. Your rate of return should be 100% according to the Bible, right? It says it right here. It says um, in Luke 17, go back there, verse 3, take heed to yourselves if your brother sins against you, Rebuke him. Now, it's not a, you know, you need to get yourself right. That ain't the rebuke it's talking about, okay? You can say it to the devil like that. But this kind of rebuke is talking about, hey, let me come to you. Hey, listen. You know, that was very offensive, you know. Have a, a sociable conversation. This is the rebuke it's talking about, okay? Not, um, it's different from the rebuke in Matthew chapter 18 where it says that you take a brother with you, you take someone else to you, and then you take it to the church. And when it says that, it doesn't mean when it says take it to the church, you get up here and say, you know, so-and-so's been sinning, and we all need to pray for him. You know, that, that ain't the right <laughs> message to display on handling offense. It is in Matthew chapter 18, but you got to read through the, the guidelines and the instructions of it. It's not actually saying that. But right here it's saying if someone offends you, it says to rebuke him. That means they come and say, listen, I don't feel right about what you said. Or, you know, how can we work this out? Okay? This is a different levels. Though. Everybody say different levels. All right? Now, it says, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Now, two-part process. It's the return and it's the forgiveness. We need to establish a, 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 a healthy return policy. Apple has one of the greatest return policies. I talked to this guy the other day. I had my phone that broke. I took it in. Um, well, not, it was a while ago. I took it in. He looked at it. They gave me a new phone. Cool thing about it is I asked the guy. I said, listen, dude, it's millions of people who come through your store every day. You guys have an excellent setup. No cash registers, no nothing. Everything is mobile. You don't touch people's devices. They have you lay your device on the table, and they leave it there and say, listen, we, we don't want to touch you. They probably had bad experiences where someone gave them their phone, and, and they grabbed it and dropped it. Oh, you broke my phone. So they got it smart. They just, you just lay your stuff on the table right there. They have an excellent plan set up if you've ever been in there. And I, he gave me a new phone. He said, listen. I said, hey, man, listen. What do you do with the old phones? He says, what we do is we have a third-party company who we associate ourselves with. You didn't want to tell me any name. I found out what the name is, though. Because <laughs> I want to know. We sell the broke product to them for them to fix. He says, we try to fix them first, and then we return it back to them. And I said, wow, uh, you guys are losing a lot of money, huh? He said, no. He says, our revenue for returns and broke products is, if they're a, if they're a, a million dollar company, the money, the money they make off your broke phone is about 500000 at least half. So if they're sitting in the billions, then the returns, the rate of return on the money they get on their returns is up about, about a million. That's incredible. He says, we're a green company. We keep everything in-house. I said, wow. And so this is why they've established this dominance over the mobile company is because they know how to handle their returns. My question to you is this. How do you handle when people return to you who come back broke and defective? What do you do? Do you turn them over to someone else for help? Because the offense is so strong, the, uh, you getting offended was so strong in your life? Or do you have a return policy and process in place where it says in the Bible, if he repents, forgive him, and if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he returns to you, I repent, the Bible says, you shall forgive him. Now, that doesn't sound like a suggestion. It sounds like a command, right? Everything I'm reading is in red letters. That's Jesus speaking. So Jesus has this return policy where I've messed up for years, and I've came back, most of us came back broken and defective. 
not used to the world anymore. And he took you in and made you something. That's one of the best return policies I know. But I don't think he, I think he put that system in place for us too. That when someone offends you, they come back broke, defective, messed up, that we should have something in place in our lives and we should have our hearts right where, you know what, it's okay, I forgive you. You don't hear what I'm saying, huh? It's hard. I, I'm, just, I'm not saying I'm teaching it like it's easy. Oh, it's hard. But if you want to be a profitable, if you want to have a profitable business, you're going to have to up your game up in your return policy. Let me say it this way. If you want this church to grow, which I think everybody does, then every person that returns that was hurt and that was broken, there should be an open door policy and a great return policy in place that when they come back, that it, it seemed like they never left before. But most churches' return policy is so bad because we remember the defective part that happened to them. And we remember the fault in their life, enabling them to take that to their grave. The church should have the best return policy in the business. The best. Because I'm going to tell you, there's going to be some people that come here and that's 100% effective. And there's going to be some people that's going to leave broken and hurt because someone offended them. Offense came. And I want to get to the point where everybody in here right now, that when someone offends you, you're like, you know what, no offense. I'm going to use that for good now. Amen? I'm bringing it home right here. About done now. Ecclesiastes 7, 21 through 22. I, I like this verse. I know it's kind of hard to find Ecclesiastic, but you'll find it. <laughs> if you got the app, you can just type it in, okay? Do not take heart all the things that people say. Least you hear your servant cursing you. Do not take everything to heart to what you say, to, to what to what they say. Do not take to heart all the things that people say. Least you hear your, cur your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. Now, unlike I'm not a perfect guy, and there's been times where I've said wrong things to good people, right? But he says, don't take to heart all the things people say. At least you hear your servant saying the same thing that you say. See, it's familiar because you said it. So if you say something, if your servant says something that offends you, it's because probably they heard, they heard you say it, right? But he says, don't take to heart these things. Everybody is in a different situation right now. Colossians 3.13, second to last verse. I love this one. Colossians 3.13, verses 13 through 14. Make allowances for each other's faults. That means make room for each other's faults, okay? Make room. Like, if you're living a life not having this expectation that, you know what, so-and-so may hurt me, guess what? You're in for a rough ride because someone is going to offend you every once in a while. It says, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Forgive. Everybody say forgive. forgive. Remember. Now, it says this. After I give you all that, remember. Bring to your remembrance this. The Lord forgave you. So you, so you must forgive others. I love verse 14, though. It says, above all, above everything I just said, clothe yourself. This is going to get you over the top right here. You thought I was going to forget this. Above all, forgiving and above all, um, making allowances. You, if you don't do this, verse 13 doesn't happen. Above all, clothe yourself with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony. If you bind and clothe, your, clothe yourself with love, then making allowances for people's faults comes natural. Let me say that again. 
If you clothe yourself with love, then making allowances, giving room for people to make mistakes is possible. But if you clothe yourself with hate, you will never make an allowance for anybody. You will continually see fault in people. You will continually see their downfalls. You will continually see their situation as horrible. But when you clothe as an individual, this goes back to taking heed of yourself. If you clothe yourself with love, I can't worry about if Sister Liz is going to clothe herself with love. That's not my business. It's my business to take back my business that I clothe myself with love so that when so when rich offend. Uh, offense comes from rich, from rich, I can say, you know what, it's okay. I made an allowance for you already. And it says to, to forgive as Christ has forgave you. Imagine all the allowances Christ had to make for you first. This, is, this goes back to taking heed to yourself. Man, he had to make a lot of allowances for me. He looked at me and said, man, you did, uh, uh, you know what? But then he goes and says, your sins and your iniquities, I remember no more. This is the attitude we need to have that our sin, your sins and your iniquities, I don't even remember them no more. Right? That's how it should be. Amen? Here we go, last verse. Getting offended is an option that can terminate your joy and can terminate your peace. Getting offended is an option that can terminate your joy and peace. Psalms 119, verse 65. Listen to this. You guys received something today? Amen. Those who love your word have great peace. Is anybody a word lover in here? I'm a word lover. So it says, those who love your word have great peace. And nothing makes them stumble. Did you catch that? Those who love your word have great peace. Is that something that everyone looks for here is great peace, right? I, I look for peace. I don't want to live a life that's not peaceful, right? We all seek peace and joy every single day. I don't want to leave out my house and not have peace. I don't want to leave out my house and not have joy. It makes your day so miserable when you don't have joy and peace. But it says those who love your word have great peace and nothing makes them stumble. So in saying that, listen, some of you guys have been on the other end of this. I know all of us have been on the offender side, but a lot of you guys are on the side of getting offended. And what we're doing simply in this series is simply this. We're learning how to handle these offenses for what they really are. And we're not going to get offended anymore by just the littlest things, you know, like I don't like your hair. Make allowances for people. If you want to grow, you can't be such a